Well, shalom, my friends, and welcome to a brand new uh, Bible study series on the book of Ephesians. Uh, we just uh, finished doing one on Genesis, a rather lengthy one with 50 chapters. Now we're going to uh, get back to the New Testament and uh, talk about uh, Paul's letter to the church at uh, Ephesus. Uh, I got a little bit of background to uh, share with you today, and uh, then what we will do is uh, go through some of the passages from the book of Acts to get a little background, um, Paul's association with uh, this church in uh, Ephesus. So we'll look at some maps and some charts and things like that, and then we will uh, get to the text itself, but not to the text of Ephesians, just the uh, background uh, textual material from the Acts of the Apostles. So let's go ahead and jump into my uh, PowerPoint with our background material. By the way, the uh, screen that you see before you is uh, a representation, of, it's actually a photograph, of the uh, present-day archaeological remains of kind of Main Street uh, in uh, Ephesus. Um, it, one of the best um, archaeological uh, sites that uh, you can visit and uh, learn about this ancient city um, and uh, kind of some of the surroundings and the environment that the, the uh, uh, Apostle Paul uh, dealt with uh, when he was uh, in this territory. So uh, let's go ahead and look at the first chart here. The book of Ephesians is one of a group of um, epistles that he wrote um, that is called the prison epistles. Uh, after Paul's third missionary journey, and uh, we will uh, take a look at a map of that. I guess I'll go ahead and uh, pull up that map of the third uh, missionary journey. Uh, here it is. Uh, on the third missionary journey, uh, Paul uh, spent a lot of time here in Ephesus. My pointer is uh, where Ephesus is located. Looks like it's right on the shores of the Aegean Sea, but actually it was uh, uh, a little bit inland, and there was a uh, river that uh, ran from Ephesus uh, or through Ephesus out to the uh, Aegean Sea. Uh, that river has uh, since dried up and kind of covered over, so the river doesn't exist anymore, but Ephesus is a little bit inland from the uh, coast. He spent a lot of time here in uh, Ephesus, <clears throat> and uh, after he was there uh, doing his uh, ministry there, oh, one of the interesting things uh, about uh, his ministry in Ephesus is that not only did he minister to the population of Ephesus and the church that had already been established uh, there, uh, but he also dealt with the Corinthians, um, having uh, contact with them via messengers, um, uh, trying to deal with some of the issues that were going on, some of the negative things that were going on in the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul took uh, one trip from Ephesus to Corinth and then back, which he called a painful uh, journey, uh, apparently wrote a uh, letter in association with that. And then two letters um, uh, were written to the Corinthians, the first from Ephesus, and then the other one later on in the uh, journey. So uh, Paul was a very busy man when he was in uh, Ephesus. And you can see that he came to Ephesus from his home church in Antioch of Syria, came overland and visited the four churches of Galatia that he had ministered to on his first and second uh, missionary journeys. Uh, then he came overland to uh, Ephesus and uh, spent a lot of time there ministering to the Ephesians and the Corinthians. And he left under kind of adverse uh, situations and traveled north to Troas, uh, then took a sea voyage to uh, Macedonia, uh, went through Macedonia down to Corinth, uh, spent some time with the uh, Corinthians there. And uh, then when uh, his time uh, was finished there in Corinth, uh, he kind of backtracked uh, his uh, passage, uh, went uh, past uh, Ephesians, but he did meet with the uh, elders of Ephesus on his way back to uh, Jerusalem. 
He was on his way to Jerusalem. He wanted to worship there. And uh, he took a sea voyage um, that the arrow depicts here and came through um, uh, modern-day Lebanon. Then it was uh, part of uh, Syria. It actually might have been part of the Promised Land. Um, down the coast to uh, Caesarea and then to Jerusalem. Now, the interesting thing about this is all along the way here, once he had left, uh, Corinth and, and uh, started his return uh, journey to the promised land. Everywhere he went, prophets and insightful uh, people um, who had credibility with Paul warned him not to go to Jerusalem uh, because trouble was awaiting him uh, there. And uh, he was not deterred by these uh, discouraging uh, reports. They were all accurate because trouble did await him there uh, when he arrived in Jerusalem. And uh, he was arrested there. Again, this is at the end of his third missionary uh, journey. So he was arrested in, in Jerusalem. And uh, one of the reasons that he was arrested in Jerusalem was that it was claimed that he had take, uh, taken a Gentile friend of his uh, past the, uh, the wall of separation uh, in the uh, temple courts that uh, no Gentile was allowed to... Uh, to transgress that uh, barrier. And uh, they claim that Paul did that. He may have done that. He may not have, have done that. Uh, even if he did, he was uh, in step with one of the things that uh, God was doing. And that was tearing down that middle wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, all are one uh, through faith in Yeshua, through faith in Jesus Christ. But anyway, he was arrested there, and then um, uh, uh, arrested in uh, Jerusalem. Actually, rescued from the um, uh, what the very aggressive uh, Jewish uh, leadership there that wanted him put to death uh, for transgressing that uh, barrier. There were some plots on his life, so uh, he was rescued by the Romans in Jerusalem and taken up here to uh, Caesarea. It's called Caesarea Maritima to distinguish between uh, that Caesarea on the seashore from uh, Caesarea Philippi that is up uh, further north uh, near Mount Hermon. So he was in Caesarea for two years. He stood trial before two Roman governors uh, and uh, the um, uh, kind of uh, Jewish puppet king, uh, one of the uh, Herods. Uh, Herod Agrippa uh, stood trial there, claimed his um, uh, his civil rights as a Roman citizen uh, to appeal this case before uh, Caesar. It's kind of interesting that just about everybody who heard his court cases and the uh, accusations uh, that uh, which would uh, the uh, prosecutors were asking for the death penalty. And when uh, all of the authorities uh, heard his uh, case, and uh, uh, even the you know the accusers uh, made their case that he should be put to death, uh, all of them thought that he was uh, innocent and said they would have let him go. But he he claimed this uh, right to appeal to Caesar, and uh, and uh, that right was granted uh, to him. Uh, which uh, ended up with uh, Paul being on a uh, sea voyage from the Promised Land uh, to Rome, where his uh, case would be heard. This was about 62 uh, AD, or uh, Common Era, that he went to Rome, uh, shipwrecked, uh, shipwrecked uh, along the way in uh, Malta, and then eventually he, uh, he did go to uh, Rome uh, where he was uh, in, in under kind of house arrest there for two years. Uh, he had uh, an apartment uh, while he was there where he lived, which probably wasn't, uh, I mean, a, it wasn't a dungeon cell or anything like that. Uh, but he was constantly uh, being guarded by uh, Roman soldiers and the authorities to make sure that he wouldn't escape. And then uh, history tells us that when his uh, case finally came up and he had a hearing before the emperor, and that would have been Nero, uh, Nero prior to the, uh, uh, the fire in Rome, when Nero started blaming Christians uh, for all his woes and troubles, um, 
So, um, yeah, Paul spent some time in Rome, and while he was there, he wrote these four epistles, um, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and uh, Philippians. Now, I think there is another letter that he wrote uh, while he was in this imprisonment, and that is the letter to the Hebrews. Now, one of the reasons that that is not on the list in this uh, picture, and uh, I don't know anything about the people who made this picture, I just used their picture because it lists the four uh, prison epistles. Uh, the reason uh, a lot of um, scholars and a lot of uh, pastors and church leaders and, and church members uh, don't think that uh, uh, Hebrews should be on this list is because a lot of people don't think Paul was the author of uh, Hebrews. And when we get around to Hebrews, we'll talk about the authorship of Hebrews. I'm pretty much convinced uh, that it was Paul, not only because of the tradition that dates way back when in Christian history, uh, but also because I think there's some internal evidence there that uh, uh, kind of uh, if it doesn't prove, it certainly implies that Paul was the author there. And uh, one of the reasons that I say Hebrews should be on the list is at the very end of the uh, epistle to the, the Hebrews, when uh, Paul is kind of uh, saying his farewell to everybody, uh, he states in one of the verses there that uh, those believers who are in Italy uh, greet you. Uh, greet the recipients of the uh, Hebrew uh, letter to the Hebrews. So I think uh, Hebrews was uh, also written by uh, Paul when he was in prison. And again, this was his first imprisonment, uh, probably 62 to 64 uh, AD. And then um, according to uh, church history, Eusebius and uh, others, uh, he was released. Uh, he had his hearing before Nero and Nero dismissed the charges. So he was uh, free to come and go as he pleased. He was released from his uh, first imprisonment there, uh, traveled around. There are some theories about what he did uh, uh, between uh, uh, that release from his first imprisonment and the second imprisonment, when again, he stood trial before uh, Nero. This would be about 68 uh, AD, a few years later. And uh, on this one, he was condemned uh, to death, and uh, he he died uh, there in Rome. Again, according to uh, according to uh, Christian uh, history and Christian uh, tradition, uh, and uh, you know that that second imprisonment was after the uh, the big fire in Rome, and uh, Nero was uh, was uh, scapegoating all the Christians, so a lot of them died uh, as a result of. Uh, of that. So, uh, yeah, uh, Ephesians is one of the four or five prison epistles. Uh, I think what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, look at our text for today from the book of Acts, and uh, we will point out um, uh, some of the geographical uh, places uh, based on these texts from Acts. So, let me go ahead and pull up uh, the uh, Bible software that we're going to use today. When I do this, when I go to my uh, share options, I don't know if you guys are seeing my uh, my menu and all the options that I have. Um, I don't know if that shows up on the video or not. So right now there's a there's a big window that that shows all my options. So I pick my Bible software, and this is. The software we're going to use today is Olive Tree uh, software. It is one of my favorite Bible software programs. Uh, and uh, uh, the one I've chosen to use for today, normally I use the Accordance uh, because it opens more windows for me. And it also has some Hebrew uh, New Testament material that uh, I like to use. So, uh, yeah, today we're going to be using the New King James Bible with all the Strong's lexicon information on it. And in my second window over here, I have uh, a Greek New Testament that I don't think we will uh, be using uh, much today, but I also have the option of going uh, to the Dake uh, Study Bible Notes. This is the uh, Dake Annotated Reference Bible uh, by uh, Finest Dake, who uh, died back in the 1980s. 
Uh, but that uh, this uh, Dake Study Bible is one of my favorites. Uh, it it uh, receives a lot of criticism, uh, maybe some of it uh, merited, uh, but Dake does an outstanding job of making reference to the uh, Greek and Hebrew original language um, information that's available for, um, uh, for his study Bible. So that's one of the reasons I like it. It's also very thought-provoking. And uh, I will say it's been a tremendous blessing to uh, me uh, throughout my Christian pilgrimage uh, because of some of the challenges that, you know, that he sets forth and uh, tends to be right on uh, a lot of things. So what we're doing now is we're going to the uh, Book of the Acts of the Apostles and looking at some of the references there about Paul's experiences with um, Ephesus, with the church at uh, Ephesus. Uh, we're starting out here in Acts 16, which is uh, in the midst of Paul's second missionary journey, uh, which takes place after the Council of Jerusalem, where it was determined that, um, uh, that believers in Yeshua, who had been born again, were under a new covenant, um, governed by new covenant law that Jesus had established. Um, and it was a, a more internalized covenant. Uh, a more personal, indwelling Holy Spirit type of covenant than the old covenant, the law of Moses. And uh, so uh, the decision at, um, at the Jerusalem uh, Council was that uh, believers in Yeshua were no longer under the law of Moses, no longer under the old covenant. Now, that's a very controversial uh, statement for me to make, uh, if you are interested in following up on that, I would encourage you to look at my video series on the Acts of the Apostles, particularly chapter uh, 15 and on, uh, and uh, also uh, the book of Galatians. Uh, the Epistle to the Galatians is a good one to read. Also Hebrews, but I haven't written my book on Hebrews yet, so uh, uh, yeah, you can uh, you can check that out. This first selection from Acts 16 takes place after Paul has uh, gone through the Galatian region with this letter that the uh, Jerusalem Council produced, basically uh, telling the Gentile congregations all over the uh, civilized world uh, that they were no longer under the law of Moses. They were, uh, uh, they were New Covenant Christians governed by the New Covenant law. Uh, after he had uh, delivered that to the uh, Galatians, then Acts 16, beginning at verse 6, tells us where uh, Paul takes off after that. Uh, verse 6 says, now when they, that would be Paul and his traveling companions, Silas and others, uh, including Timothy, I believe, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, Galatia is where those four churches were that were planted by Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. So, of course, uh, with this letter in hand from the Jerusalem Council, uh, they uh, go back through all those churches to deliver that letter and the, you know, the liberation that the uh, Galatian churches would experience. So they passed through Phrygia and uh, the region of Galatia. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So keep, keep in mind some of these places that are mentioned here, Phrygia, Galatia, and Asia. And then uh, also in verse 7, after they had come to Mycia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. And really, that's as far as we need to go in Acts chapter 16. But let me pull this map up here again and show you where some of these places are. Again, this is second uh, Paul's second missionary journey. So he leaves actually from Jerusalem, travels up here to Antioch, gets the blessing of the congregation, and travels through his uh, past his hometown of Tarsus in Cilicia, and then he goes to Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch. And these are the Galatian churches. Here's the region of Galatia. So some people call this Southern Galatia, which is right. Um, uh, so he goes through those, uh, those four cities. And then he continues on here, uh, kind of to the northwest, uh, coming eventually to Troas, which is ancient Troy. Now, 
what I want to do is mention uh, the fact that as they began to to leave Galatia and Phrygia, let's see, where's uh, where is Phrygia? Oh, I should have been prepared to uh, show you where Phrygia is. Pamphylia. Oh, here it is, Phrygia. Okay, there's Phrygia. Pamphylia and Phrygia. So they passed by there. And what they want to do is do ministry in Asia. Um, this was also called Asia. When we hear Asia, we think of China and Russia, I guess, and uh, some of the kind of Far Eastern uh, countries. This is called, uh, it was called Asia Minor. Nowadays, we call it Turkey. But then it was called Asia Minor. And uh, Paul and his traveling companions desired to do some ministry in Asia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them uh, do that. So he steered them in another direction. Um, also, as they continued north here, kind of being forbidden to go to Asia, uh, it says they were passing through Mycenae, which is this kind of uh, upper northwest region of Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. Uh, but as they were passing through here, they had their eye on Bithynia and Pontus, uh, up here uh, almost to the Black Sea. So this kind of purple region is another place that they wanted to go and do ministry, and the Holy Spirit said no. So they wanted to go uh, southwest, they wanted to go northeast, they wanted to go over here west to Mycia. The Holy Spirit kept saying no. So in obedience, they just continued their journey until they came to Troas, and that is where the Apostle Paul is going to have a, uh, a vision of a man from Macedonia calling for help. So uh, Paul and uh, the others feel like they need to heed that call for assistance and take the gospel to all these, um, uh, these places. Some of those are um, uh, churches that Paul would establish, would found, and write letters to, like the church at Philippi and the Thessalonian churches, and uh, so forth. And eventually, he would head down here to Greece. So I wanted to show you uh, some of the geography there associated with that. And now we'll go back to our texts for today. Um, I said all, all we needed to do was look at uh, just a couple of verses from Acts 16. So uh, let me uh, go from Acts 16 to Acts 18, uh, verse uh, 18. Uh, this takes place at the end of his second missionary journey, uh, when he's about to uh, jump on a boat and go uh, back towards uh, Jerusalem and his home congregation of Antioch in Syria. So we'll just pick up the text here. Uh, in Acts 18, and let me also uh, pull up my uh, Dake study Bible notes just in case we need them. Uh, Acts 18, 18, so Paul still remained a good while. Uh, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Uh, so this is where he's jumped on the ship, and he's going to head back east to the promised land, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, who are uh, close friends of his and do a lot of ministry with him in the various uh, places, he keeps bumping into them in Ephesus and in uh, uh, Corinth and various other places and so forth. So they're fast friends. And Priscilla and Aquila, it's a husband and wife team, and they're very active in uh, ministry. But it tells us here, before he left the, um, the uh, Peloponnesus, I guess, the Greek um, country, the country of Greece. It says he had his hair cut off at Concrea, which was a neighboring city to uh, Corinth there, uh, for he had taken a vow. And this was undoubtedly a Nazarite vow uh, based on Numbers chapter 6 in the Old Testament, where a person would make a particular vow. And while they were under this vow, they would grow their hair long and then they would avoid uh, any contact with dead bodies or any kind of corruption. Uh, they would also uh, abstain from any products from the grapevine, including uh, wine and uh, harder um, kind of grape uh, drinks like brandy and things like that. But also um, what, um, uh, like um, uh, raisins, 
uh, if they were made from grapes and stuff like that. So some of the food products from the grapevine. So he had taken this vow, but it says he cut off his hair at Concrea. So apparently the vow was ended. So we don't really know when he started this vow uh, or what the uh, what the contents of the, the vow involved. Uh, but he cut off his hair in Concrea before he uh, sailed away from Greece. And uh, he, he was no longer under the vow. But then it says he came to Ephesus. So um, um, let me go back to uh, Ephesus on the map and, and show you where, where Ephesus is. So here's where he left uh, Concrea after his vow, and he sails over here to Ephesus. Now, he's only going to be there a brief time, uh, but this is his first contact with Ephesus. Remember, on the way out, he wanted to minister, minister throughout Asia, which probably would have involved Ephesus and some of the other churches in the region. Uh, I have a map on my uh, PowerPoint of the uh, seven churches of the book of Revelation, and if Ephesus is one of those uh, churches. I don't think we'll probably look at it uh, today, but we will uh, <clears throat> go ahead then. So he came to Ephesus and he left them there. That's Aquila and Priscilla. He left them in Ephesus to kind of help uh, run things and uh, be leaders there in the uh, church at Ephesus. Uh, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So he's sharing the gospel of Yeshua there in the uh, largely Pharisaic uh, synagogue uh, in the city of Ephesus. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent. So uh, his preaching was popular enough. People were interested in it. They wanted to learn more. They asked him to hang around Ephesus for a bit longer, uh, but he, he didn't because he had an agenda that, we, that he wanted to carry out. Uh, but he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And then it goes on to say he landed at uh, Caesarea and then went, went back up to uh, uh, Antioch in Syria, uh, his, uh, his home congregation. So uh, that's really all we need to read from Acts 18. Um, uh, remember that, um, uh, let me see, I want my stuff. Uh, we'll go to Acts 19. And, uh, this is part of the, uh, this is part of the third missionary journey. Cause this time he starts out kind of the same way he started out the second missionary journey, but on the third missionary journey, he comes overland and uh, arrives in Ephesus. Now, I've just shown you where ex uh, Ephesus is <clears throat> on the second missionary journey map. So uh, although I have a map of the third missionary journey, I don't think I need to go to it right now. So um, uh, it happened, uh, this is um, Acts chapter 19. It, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Now, let's talk a little bit about Apollos because uh, this is somebody that uh, Paul actually has very little contact with. Uh, but we learn uh, some things about Apollos. He was a good guy. Uh, he apparently was a disciple of John the Baptist. Having received baptism from John the Baptist, apparently, probably while John was still alive or maybe shortly after his death, uh, he took off on his own and was doing ministry all over the place, uh, including uh, Corinth, we see here, but he had been to Ephesus. He'd been to Ephesus for a while, had some dealings with Aquila and Priscilla. Remember, Paul had left them there in Ephesus. And they did their best to bring him up to date, to tell him more about Jesus than he had learned from uh, John the Baptist, uh, learn more about baptism and, and uh, so forth from Aquila and Priscilla. <clears throat> but then before Paul arrived, uh, Apollos had moved on to uh, Corinth and was doing some good work uh, there. So it happened while Paul uh, Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, uh, came to Ephesus. And uh, upper regions would just be places that were north of uh, Ephesus. So uh, he probably co uh, covered a lot of territory there in Asia Minor. 
And uh, so he comes to Ephesus and finding some disciples uh, there in Ephesus, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit uh, when you believed? <clears throat> now we're going to uh, learn, uh, we're going to read a little bit more about this, um, this um, uh, baptism uh, and baptism in the Holy Spirit matter. Um, I'm going to say um, right here and now uh, that the receiving of the Holy Spirit that, that Paul is talking about is the Pentecostal, uh, day of Pentecost type uh, reception and experience of the Holy Spirit, which is usually accompanied by uh, spiritual gifts and um, supernatural behaviors. Now, having said that, I also want to indicate that when you become a believer in Yeshua and are born again, and receive salvation from God. Uh, one of the, it's kind of a package deal, and uh, one uh, one thing you get in the package deal is the new birth. You're born again, uh, and uh, the other thing you get is the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now Yeshua talked about the uh, uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in two chapters in John's Gospel. One of those is chapter four, where he's dealing with the uh, Samaritan woman. And uh, at the well there in um, uh, in the city of, uh, in the region of Samaria, and uh, Jesus asks her for a drink, and she's surprised that he would ask her. She's a Samaritan, he's a Jew. The Jews and Samaritans don't get along very well. But then Jesus says, uh, "If you knew who was asking you for this drink, you would ask me, and I would give you living water, and then you wouldn't have to return to this well because it." Uh, because uh, the living water uh, provides uh, eternal satisfaction for the spiritual thirst. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> so he goes on to describe this experience of living water that he's talking about as uh, the spirit is like a, a, a wellspring, uh, uh, kind of rising up within a person. This is the indwelling Holy Spirit and producing eternal life. Um like giving you a like a whole different mindset. You receive the mind of Christ. That's a part of part of the uh, package deal. So that is the born again salvation uh, experience, um, more technically and theologically defined as um, uh, being justified uh, by God's grace through faith. So this is salvation. Uh, it's a um, major turning point in the believer's life. But then in chapter 7 of John's Gospel, he goes to one of the big festivals um, at, at Jerusalem, and there in the temple courts, or the temple precincts at least, uh, Jesus kind of makes a speech, and it's an invitation. He says, whoever's thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and um, basically gives them the same message that he had given the Samaritan woman. Uh, if you believe in me, uh, the Holy Spirit will come inside, and you will experience this wellspring rising up in you, producing salvation for you. But in chapter 7, he says, uh, for, for those who experience that, the, the intake of the Holy Spirit, uh, by the way, in uh, John chapter 7, he defines the living water as being the presence and power of the Holy Spirit indwelling people. Shekinit uh, uh, Otam, in dwelling within them, the Shekinah glory of God living in uh, in people. So, uh, uh, yeah, he tells the uh, the people in Jerusalem in John chapter seven. He says, "Out of your innermost being, that's where the Holy Spirit lives. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water." So in John chapter 4, it's taking in the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, it is the outflow of the Holy Spirit, which started in the church on the day of Pentecost and has continued ever since, in spite of the uh, theories of various theologians who believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural empowering of the Holy Spirit was only for the first century. And uh, we could go into that, but we're not going to. So uh, he said to these uh, disciples that he found, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And let's understand that he's talking about 
did you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as Jesus called it? Did you did you receive a, a Pentecostal equipping of the Holy Spirit? So they said to him, we have not uh, so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Um, so basically, they're saying, uh, this sounds like a foreign language uh, to us. Well, Paul responds to that by saying, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. This would be a reference to John the Baptist. Uh, so I think John's baptism, uh, it was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, just like Christian baptism or Nazarene Christian uh, baptism uh, is. It is for repentance. It's for the forgiveness of sins. And these are the prerequisite requirements for one to be born again and, and to have eternal salvation. So, um, uh, yeah, they were uh, probably were not baptized by John the Baptist himself, but they received the type of baptism that that John was was dealing out. And I would say it's a John 4 experience. The Holy Spirit goes into you. Now, maybe John did preach about the ministry of the Holy Spirit when you're saved, the, you know, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Um, but uh, regardless, these guys have been baptized into John's baptism, but they don't know much about the uh, Holy Spirit. So, let me ask you this. Who do you think baptized these guys? Well, my bet is that it was Apollos before he left uh, to go to Corinth. Uh, he had probably taught them, ministered to them, and then baptized them the way John the Baptist had baptized, the way John baptized Apollos, and the way Ap Apollos had been baptizing other people. So they had received John's uh, baptism. And then uh, Paul said, uh, uh, and then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to uh, people that they should believe on him uh, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus, Mashiach Yeshua. Uh, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, before we go any further, we need to decide who the they is here. Because Paul has just been talking about those who heard John and received his baptism. So was it talking about those people? When those people heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Or is it these Ephesian disciples? Is the they a reference to them? <clears throat> so did they decide... Well, we've received uh, John's baptism, but we need to receive a baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, so is Paul talking here about the disciples of John the Baptist or the disciples here in Ephesus? And I think it could be either one. But based on what I understand about John's baptism, I would say that if they received John's baptism, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, that they have been born again, and they don't need another baptism. Now, I don't think another baptism is going to hurt them if they, if they want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but I don't think they would have been required to, uh, to receive that. So, that might be an indication that the they we're talking about is not the Ephesian disciples, but the disciples of John the Baptist. In other words, if you've received John's baptism, then you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because uh, remember, after Jesus was baptized by John, he and John continued their ministry uh, for a while. So, this is really... <laughs> Uh, kind of a, um, a rabbit trail that we've gone down for a little bit here. But, uh, you know, it's kind of fun to uh, talk about uh, baptism and some of the controversies surrounding it. So these guys uh, either are satisfied with the, their baptism, the baptism of John the Baptist, or they were rebaptized uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 6 says, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So 
if they were uh, uh, rebaptized by Paul, uh, then that same day they manifested spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues and prophecy and uh, supernatural manifestation. So if that's what happened here, then they did receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit when they were baptized in water. And then the text, uh, this little episode ends with the text telling us now the men were about 12 in all. And just a reminder, this is all taking place in Ephesus, uh, the uh, church community to whom Paul is writing the letter of the Ephesians, the epistle to the Ephesians. And uh, he went into the uh, synagogue, that is Paul, and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning pers uh, and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But uh, when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, and let me say, uh, this is the uh, Greek word, hodos, uh, and that was the, um, uh, if, uh, for Greek speakers, the early name of the church was Ha, Hados, the way, like the road or the path. Um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this that's probably where this name uh, came from. So the church wasn't really called the church. They were called the way. Uh, they weren't called Christians until, uh, you know, a, a, a later period of time. And uh, that first started in Antioch of Syria, which was uh, Paul's home church. But they spoke evil of the way. Another name that the early church had was the Nazarim, which is Hebrew for the Nazarenes. Uh, and uh, uh, they um, were called that because uh, Jesus was a Nazarene. Now, when most people hear you say that, they think, well, that means he was from Nazareth, and he was from Nazareth, uh, but, but he would not be called a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. Uh, if, he, if somebody was making reference to his hometown, they would call him a Nazarati, uh, a resident of Nazareth. There's a T in the, uh, uh, the name uh, Nazareth. So, uh, uh, Nazarene or Nazarene is a reference to one of the sects of Judaism at uh, this point in biblical history. Everybody's familiar with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, lately, in recent times, people are familiar with the Essenes, which was another sect, uh, because of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. These were the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Essenes were uh, basically uh, celibate monks. But there were also people who adhered to the uh, teachings and the doctrine of the uh, Essenes, uh, but married and raised families and stuff like that. And uh, uh, Jesus was one of them. Uh, I'm not saying that Jesus married and raised a family, but he, he could have if that would have been uh, God's will. Uh, but I think you can make a pretty good case for uh, Joseph and Mary, the parents of uh, Jesus being uh, being Nazarene, so uh, so Hanotzerim is a uh, a reference to the sect that Jesus uh, kind of represented. Uh, so they spoke evil of the way or the church before the multitude, and he departed from them and re withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Uh, let's see if uh, Dake has anything about the uh, school of Tyrannus. A school of a well-known teacher of that region. Uh, two years were spent here. Jews and Greeks uh, still came to hear him. And uh, let me say also, the uh, typical pattern of Paul when he would come to a new community was to uh, share the gospel in the Pharisaic synagogue um, until he got kicked out. And then when he got kicked out, he would usually establish home churches. Uh, which he did in most of the communities. Uh, so most of the communities that he writes epistles to, uh, he's writing to home churches. He's writing to small groups that gather in people's homes rather than big assembly uh, assembly uh, buildings. So uh, here it says uh, he withdrew from the synagogue just because of the opposition and the hardness of hearts of the uh, unbelievers. And he went to the school of uh, Tyrannus. 
um, separated from the disciples here in Dake stuff. This is all that could be done. Christians had to start congregations of their own. Paul spent three years here, and all Asia Minor heard the word. So the gospel was being very successful there. Uh, so this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord uh, Jesus, Yeshua, both Yahudim and Yavanim, Jews and Greeks. Uh, verse 11 continues the story in Ephesus. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paulos, of Paul. Uh, interesting, uh, wh when we get to, um, well, we're not going to... Um, I was going to discuss the um, the name that Paul is given throughout the New Testament. In the Greek New Testament, he's usually called Paul. There are also references to his Hebrew name, Shaul, uh, or Saul. Uh, but some of the uh, modern uh, Hebrew New Testaments uh, don't even use uh, Paulos because it's Greek. Uh, and they would lead you to the conclusion that, that uh, Paul was only called Saul throughout, like, throughout his life. Uh, but I don't think that's I don't think that's the case. That's kind of a bias toward uh, Hebrew that's probably not appropriate. So uh, let me get rid of that. That was an accident. <laughs> now God uh, worked unusual miracles by the hands of uh, Paul, Paulos in Greek, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Uh, what's going on here is that uh, Paul, in many places where he ministered, uh, also helped uh, make ends meet by working as a tent maker. And uh, I don't know exactly what tent making involves, uh, but it's manual labor, uh, probably, you know, involves uh, the need for some aprons uh, or handkerchiefs. Uh, it might be like a bandana that he would tie around his head, maybe to keep his hair out of his eyes, although he cut it off recently, uh, um, or uh, aprons, probably like a shop apron. And it sounds like after Paul would get off work, he would probably hang up his aprons and his handkerchiefs uh, and, uh, you know, go about his business then until the next day's work. But people took those handkerchiefs and aprons and... Uh, that had touched his body, that took him out to sick people, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now, I do want to, um, I do want to say, I don't think there's necessarily any supernatural power associated with garments or pieces of cloth that have touched a believer, uh, a person who has been baptized in the Spirit. But it's possible. Um, you know, it's possible that since uh, the Holy Spirit was in Paul and these garments were on Paul, that there might have been like a, what, kind of a remnant of, uh, of the Holy Spirit attached to these garments. So, I mean, there may have been a, a physical uh, thing here. I think rather what it is, is people would say, uh, well, here's a handkerchief or here's an apron from the Apostle Paul, and you know he's healed a lot of people. So, uh, like, if you touch this, or if, if I place this on your body, you're going to get well. If they believed that that was going to happen, then then their faith would would make them well. So you can make out of the uh, aprons and handkerchiefs uh, what you want. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what the uh, you know the actual theological truth is uh, here, but I know faith is powerful even when it is uh, attached to or when its object is, is something uh, a little off. Uh, verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. An exorcist is a person who casts out evil spirits, and an itinerant exorcist is one who travels around from place to place. So some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exorcise you uh, by Yeshua, whom Paulos uh, preaches. So there were some who were successful at casting out demons in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, that's how Jesus taught uh, people to do it. That's how uh, all Christian, Nazarene Christians, and even Jews were involved in this. 
Some Jewish leaders accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of, uh, by an evil uh, power, by the power of uh, Satan. Uh, but then he challenged them and said, well, if I'm doing it by Satan, then who are your sons, he says, who are your disciples, your friends, who are they casting them out by? Uh, so the whole idea is um, uh, using the authority of the name of Jesus, uh, demons can be cast out. Uh, verse 14, also there were seven sons of Skeva, a uh, Jewish uh, chief priest, a Kohen, who, who did so. Um, uh, a chief priest, probably a local uh, chief priest. Uh, this would be a Levite, a descendant of Aaron, uh, who was probably uh, living in, um, in Ephesus, and he was probably the leading priest there. There were, there were probably some others who were lower than him. It doesn't mean that he was the, you know, the one chief priest that was able to go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. So uh, anyway, uh, he and uh, his seven sons were out there casting out demons also. And the evil spirit answered and said, Yeshua, Jesus, I know, and Paulos, Paul, I know, but who are you? So the demon challenges him. Uh, the demon uh, hears him using Yeshua's name and uh, is kind of challenging him, him and saying, uh, you can only use that name if you're a believer. So if you don't have the faith there, I'm going to be able to do a number on you. And uh, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Which brings up the question, can an unbeliever use the name of Yeshua and cast out demons? I think the answer to that question is yes. I'm not sure. But my theology tells me that, yes, they can. So what was the deal with these guys? If they were unbelievers and they used the name of Jesus, could those uh, demons be cast out? Yes, unless, uh, uh, first of all, let me say that the name of Yeshua has to be used in faith, in confidence that what you command in the name of Yeshua will happen. But if this evil spirit was able to discourage the sons of Sceva uh, so that they lost faith in the authority of the name of Jesus, then that's why the spirits could beat them up. And so uh, that's why casting out demons is part of spiritual warfare. And uh, sometimes uh, even believers are going to lose those battles uh, because the, the demons fight back. And if you get scared and lose your faith, uh, you might lose that uh, battle. Uh, but the name of Jesus is very powerful in uh, overcoming and uh, sending away evil spirits. Verse 17, this became known both to all Yehudim and Yavanim, Jews and Greeks, dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of Adonai Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, was magnified. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, by and large, the name of uh, Jesus was being used effectively to cast out demons, and people became aware of it. Uh, there were probably some healings and miracles involved as well. And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic. Uh, Dake says uh, the, the Greek term here, periergos, uh, means practicing magic. And I think it does. I think that is uh, accurate. Uh, but I think this would also include people who were part of a false religion. One of the things that we're going to learn about Ephesus is that it was the uh, uh, place of the temple of Diana, uh, one of the Greek or uh, Roman uh, goddesses. And uh, I think the, the temple to uh, Diana was one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, if not, it was a very well-known and uh, very active uh, temple of, of, a false, uh, of a false religion. So, uh, yeah, people who had been associated with false religions or practiced magic, they brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Uh, now, one of the things about Satanism and uh, magic is it, it has a lot of books, just like 
other religions do. It, it is a religion. It's a satanic religion. Uh, when I was just starting out um, studying theology, uh, I heard about this book called uh, The Satanic Bible. And uh, probably wasn't very smart, but I thought, uh, you know, I need to see if I can get a hold of a satanic Bible. I think the um, uh, author was um, uh, somebody McVeigh, uh, Alexander, Alexander McVeigh, something like that. Anyway, the Satanic Bible. So I went to a secular bookstore and, uh, you know, asked them if they had the Satanic Bible. And they told me they're, they're, they were sold out, that they couldn't keep it on the shelves. So people are interested in these uh, false occultic religions. I eventually was able to get a copy of it. It was kind of interesting. It's just kind of a modern day uh, version of uh, ancient paganism. Uh, you know, the material universe is uh, uh, thought to be what? The, the mother of uh, all humanity. Uh, it was thought for the longest time, the material universe was thought for the longest time uh, to be infinite. And so, you know, finite people are supposed to worship the infinite and so forth. So it's um, a uh, book I got rid of a while back, which was probably a good idea. Uh, cause it's, I mean, it's full of false stuff. It's full of lies. And if you start believing it, it can affect your faith. So they burned all these, uh, magic books in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them in a total of 50,000 pieces of silver. So it was worth a lot. So the word of the Lord uh, grew mightily and prevailed, uh, verse 21. Now, when these things were accomplished, Paul proposed in the spirit, that is the Holy Spirit was prompting him to do this. Uh, was proposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So uh, this is kind of the end of his third missionary uh, journey. The Holy Spirit is telling him to uh, kind of to head back to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and after I've been there, he says, I must also see Rome. Now, this may be some hint. No, uh, earlier in this video, we talked about the fact that as he is returning home, going eastward, headed for Jerusalem, at every stop along the way, people tell him bad things are going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. But here he's saying, the Holy Spirit's telling me go to Jerusalem, and after I've been there, I will go see Rome. Well, that's what in, in, ends up happening. But it happens because he is arrested there, and he's charged with a... Um, a capital crime, he's tried in Caesarea and appeals his case to Caesar, and that's why he goes to Rome. So what he's saying here is true. I just don't know how much insight he had over the trials and tribulations it would take to get him to Rome and witness to Caesar. But when Jesus saved him on the Damascus Road, one of the things that he told Paul was that his calling and his mission was going to involve bearing witness of the gospel to kings, uh, you know, to uh, Jewish people and uh, uh, foreign people, and to kings. And uh, evidently that involved Caesar as well. Uh, so he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Arastus, uh, but he himself stayed in Asia in uh, Ephesus for a time. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. Remember, we said that was the name of the church. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver in, uh, shrines of uh, Diana, uh, brought uh, no small profit uh, to the uh, craftsmen. So there was a whole business, probably a lot of business, surrounding this temple of Diana. And these uh, silversmiths and these um, uh, other metal uh, workers uh, made these uh, shrines of Diana, which might be like a little tabernacle that you could have for your home and maybe an image of Diana within that. And you'd set that up on your mantelpiece or on your coffee table and uh, worship these false gods. So uh, anyway, this guy Demetrius, who's a silversmith and makes these shrines, uh, he called them together with the workers of similar occupation, the other guys who were in the same business. And he said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. So they're losing money. 
I uh, don't know how much they love Diana, but they love the money they're making off of her uh, temple. Moreover, you see in here uh, that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, which emphasizes to us how much the ministry of Paul, basically the gospel, a Christian gospel ministry, was radiating out from Ephesus and was impacting the surrounding areas of Asia, uh, which is awesome. Uh, so a revival is happening there. This Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. And of course, he's right. That's what the Bible is trying to tell everybody. But when you threaten people's religion that probably they were raised on, like the religion of Diana, uh, when you tell them that Diana's nothing, um, they're not always going to be friendly uh, to you. You know, they're putting their hope of eternal salvation on this chick, uh, this uh, Diana. I hope it's okay to call her that. Uh, so, uh, and then if you add to that money that's being made from this uh, religion, you start taking money away from people and they're going to get even more uh, hostile. And I'm sure, uh, I mean, they accuse people, of Paul, of saying, uh, that gods made with hands are not gods at all. I'm sure that's exactly what he was saying. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana uh, may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And that is not a exaggerated uh, claim. Uh, Diana was one of the uh, pantheon of the Greek and later the Roman gods, goddess, gods and goddesses. Uh, so yeah, she was influential all over the world. But this was her headquarters. Ephesus was her headquarters. Uh, now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Uh, so the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, uh, pass, uh, Paul's uh, travel companions. And uh, when Paul uh, wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him to, because he would, he, he would have been in danger if he would gone. What, where does it say they went? Did they go in, they went into the theater which would be like an outdoor stadium. It's not like a movie theater, but it's like an outdoor stadium with, uh, you know, uh, uh, surrounding uh, seats and then like a, a stage or, you know, in this case, like a Bema seat, a judgment seat uh, down there. Now, I want to comment a little bit about this riot. Um you know, uh, uh, previously, uh, uh, before this, uh, the last year of my life, uh, I thought uh, basically such things uh, happening in America, where I live, were kind of a thing of the past. You know, there used to be um, demonstrations, mostly peaceful demonstrations for civil rights and, you know, for uh, a lot of good things. And that's just part of the American uh, society. But recently, since a war in Israel uh, broke out back on, in, uh, on October 7th of 2023, uh, so it's uh, been going on for the good part of a year, uh, I saw something that absolutely stunned me in my country. Now, if I had seen this in the Middle East, it wouldn't have surprised me at all, uh, because um, most of the countries in the Middle East hate the Jews, they hate Israel, uh, they want them destroyed. But I was seeing demonstrations in America, violent demonstrations, uh, uh, where people are in danger, where property is destroyed, uh, where uh, government property is being defaced and destroyed. And these people are not only supporting the so-called innocent uh, Palestinians uh, who are being defeated uh, by the, uh, the IDF, the uh, Israeli Defense Force. But they are supporting Hamas, which is a, a terrorist uh, organization. Uh, and there are large numbers of them. And these demonstrations, these riots are occurring all over the place. 
Uh, so um, I don't know. It's like, uh, you know, the Bible is uh, suddenly becoming even more relevant in my uh, day and age. So uh, these people are just kind of caught up in the riot and they rush into the theater just chanting what everybody else is chanting, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. And when Paul wanted to go in, the disciples wouldn't let him go for fear that he'd be killed in the uh, then some of the officials of Asia who were uh, his friends uh, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So I don't know if these are uh, believers or not, but they're friends of his. He's been there three years uh, doing great work there. Uh, some therefore cried one thing and some another for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. They just, if there's a riot, they want to be a part of it. And this is another similarity to the uh, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, pro-Hezbollah, pro-Iran uh, demonstrations that I am seeing. Uh, for those uh, news people, those journalists who are uh, bold enough and brave enough to um, put a microphone in some of those people's faces and ask them questions, they have no idea what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, they uh, one of their favorite chants nowadays is from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. The river they're talking about is the Jordan River and the sea they're talking about is the Mediterranean Sea. And what they are crying for, what they are uh, uh, hoping to accomplish is the genocide of all Jewish people. Uh, Hamas wants all the Jews killed. They don't want a two-state solution. They don't want to live side by side with the Jews. They want to kill all the Jews. And so does Hezbollah, and so does Iran, and so do many of the uh, uh, Muslims uh, in that uh, country. So people are caught up in this uh, these demonstrations uh, in support of the Palestinians and, and Hamas, and they have no idea what's going on. Uh, they don't, I mean, they uh, Apparently, they don't watch the news, so they don't know about the hostage, the Jewish hostages that have been taken, and, he, and American hostages as well. They don't seem to know anything about that. When people put up posters, they rip those posters down so, so other people can't be made aware of hostages being taken and stuff like that. So, uh, yep, nothing new under the sun. Uh, let's see, verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, they're all confused, they'd all come together, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, uh, apparently a, a representation of the, the church, a representative of the church, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people, but when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out uh, for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Okay, Ephesus is a Gentile city, and Alexander is a Jew, but he's representing Christianity. And so when he says something favorable about Christianity, uh, they, they, what? They acknowledge that he is Jewish. So are Christians Jewish? The answer is yes, they are. Uh, by conversion. Uh, they have been grafted into the tree of Judaism, as uh, Paul describes in Romans uh, chapter 11. If you'd like to learn more about that, I have a, a video series on uh, the book of Romans, and I've also written a commentary on that. So check out the olive tree of Judaism. If you are a believer in Jesus, uh, you are not a follower of a Christian God who created a new religion. You are a follower of a Jewish Messiah who created a body, an assembly of people who were at that time mainly Jews. Now they're mainly Gentiles, uh, but who are under the new covenant of the, um, uh, of the, the God of the, the Bible. And uh, so you have been grafted into believing Judaism. When they found out he was a Jew, they all cry, uh, cried out for about two hours, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. And you, you'd think they would get tired of saying the same thing. But these protesters, the pro-Palestinian protesters, they don't get tired. They just keep saying the same thing over and over again. 
Uh, and uh, when this, and by the way, uh, in my opinion, uh, they're not persuading anybody. They're just making people mad. Um, uh, they burn American flags, and the Americans in general don't like that. It's not illegal, but but they don't approve of. Uh, so they're not persuading anybody to, <laughs> to support Hamas. Uh, so anyway, uh, verse 35, when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, uh, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus is a temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, uh, since uh, these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. That's kind of a bold statement and I think arguable because they were speaking against uh, the temple of Diana. Uh, therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro -counsels. That would be legal representatives of the Roman government. Let them bring charges against uh, one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in a lawful, in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar and uh, uh, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So he's trying to change a mob into a reasonable um you know, a uh, uh, group of people who would make a rational and legal argument against uh, Paul and the others and uh, so forth. So um, Paul is going to leave uh, shortly after that in verse, uh, in chapter 20 of, the, of Acts, in verse 1, it says, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. And then it says, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Now remember, while he was in Ephesus, yes, he was ministering to the Ephesians and the surrounding uh, regions of Asia, but he was also ministering to the Corinthians. And uh, he loved those folks. He knew there was a lot of stuff wrong there. And uh, he was eager to get back to Corinth and see how things were going, how they had responded to his letters. He's already wrote first, written 1 Corinthians. When he gets to Macedonia, probably in Philippi, uh, he wrote 2 Corinthians. And then he went and visited them. And, uh, you know, I think probably for the most part, everything was resolved or at least put on the right uh, track. So, that brings us to the end of our video. In the next one, uh, we will look at uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1. I have kind of enjoyed using my Olive Tree Bible software, so I might use that for Ephesians, or I might go back to Accordance. Oh, I'll have to pray about that and see what we want to do. So uh, anyway, uh, since we're at the end of the video, let me give you a blessing, and this one will be from the New Testament. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And uh, so now I will uh, bring this video to a conclusion and say shalom, shalom. Hope to see you next time.